7-0-9-34-72-89 with the jackpot number of 23. We're out somewhere in the Rainbow Nebula cluster. And we've come upon some large freakish phenomenon on scanners. Captain, I believe that I've gotten the creature on the main viewer. Uhura, try to communicate with the creature out there in the outer space. Yes, sir. Lines are open. This is uh, Captain James T. Kirk of the USS Enterprise. We are on a diplomatic... Silence, creatures of Earth. I am Green Man. I am here to judge you for chopping down all of the trees. I will now destroy your spaceship. Sir, pew, 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 pew. You must face some creature in mortal combat. Okay, everyone, welcome back. It's lecture 26. I'm Art Turlip. This is ZC 20002. Here we go. Magnitude and frequency scaling. We're looking at chapter 28 today. Despite my belief that it's actually 27 and the lecture number is 25, I don't know what's happening anymore. Someone please send help. All right. Well, today is much better than the previous lecture. For, fortunately for you, you probably got to watch one lecture a day. I'm recording both of these back to back because uh, I'm quite a bit behind on where I want to be. Um, so here we go. What do we need magnitude and frequency scaling for? So most of the time when we build our examples, we build like these little toy examples, you know, and they're nice and all, but, you know, we can't really translate them into something that is useful for us. So we design circuits that have like two farad capacitors and we're like, oh yeah, that's great. And then in reality, it's like, oh, wait a minute. No, those, those are totally unrealistic. So, um, we got to make sure that we keep ourselves, uh, you know, ourselves grounded. Uh, but at the same time, why can't we just build these toy examples and then just translate them over. And as a matter of fact, that's exactly what we're going to do because it's much easier to build those toy examples than throw big numbers around all over the place and then um, have to worry about those. Rather, we'll use simple numbers that work well with the units that we have at our disposal already and uh, then just transfer them over. Um, funny enough, the transfer function uh, suits that purpose just fine. And what we're going to do uh, and see today is that all we're doing is slightly manipulating the transfer function at the end of the day, if we do it all. And in fact, our main goal is to maintain the inherent structure of the transfer function. All right. Makes sense. So let's do a toy example real quick. Um, so here we have some really petty resistance here, right? We have one ohm and two ohms. This is taking you back probably to your freshman year where you're just like plugging in numbers and look at me, I can do V equals IR. Well, um, that's exactly what we're going to do, kind of, except we're, you know, a lot further along so we can do cool things like the transfer function. And guess what? It's like basically the same thing because this is still just that voltage division problem you did like a year or two ago. Okay. So it's pretty trivial here what the transfer function is. Um, in the frequency domain, these guys don't depend on time, right? They, they can't, they, they're constant. So they're constant in the frequency domain as well. Um, so suppose we use a simple nine volt battery, right? It's got about, uh, you know, 1.5 to three amp, amp hours of battery life to it. And so we'll be drawing three amps through the circuit. We're not going to last very long. Okay. It's just, this just ain't going to happen. So what are we going to have here? Um, well, in our V out is just, you know, good luck. <laughs> it's fine, but it's, uh, we're not going to have, you know, enough time with that, uh, with that much current flowing through. So that's the real issue here is how do we make this a more realistic circuit? So let's scale this um, by a factor of a thousand. We're going to scale the impedances by a factor of a thousand, making our net resistance equal to three 
kilo ohms. All right, now we're cooking with oil. So now we're only drawing about three milliamps of uh, current, and so our battery life is extended by like a thousand times. Um, but note that our transfer function here is still just two over three, right? It's the ratio between those two things we had here and here, because our voltage division still just gives us a unitless quantity. Notice here that H of S is unitless. And today we're going to reemphasize the fact that um, H of S, our transfer function, may change in what units is actually representing. In case you haven't noticed yet, the units have been bouncing around like uh, my kids when I give them a bunch of candy. Okay, it's like climbing the walls in terms of what units it's using. But there's actually a, you know, just a few cases that it tends to fall into. Um, so this is important because we can use the same trick with time-dependent reactive circuits. So let's see what happens with time-dependent reactive circuits. Um, but first, let's just apply a general rule of thumb here first. We're going to multiply resistances inductances, general impedances, and current controlled volt voltage sources, which we'll call Rm, by Km, this factor. Now keep in mind, this, uh, this is capital K with a, um, with a lowercase m, but the main takeaway here is that we're going to have two different Ks floating around, so make sure you keep track of these uh, subscripts, because M is going to stand for magnitude, and F is going to stand for frequency, okay? So just be careful. Um, and we're also going to divide any conductances, capacitances, general admittances, and voltage-controlled... Uh, oops. Current sources... GM okay and in these cases we're not going to you know double pad something um, just do it once is, is fine you know you don't have to look at it from six different angles and apply that factor you know seven different times we just apply the factor one time to whatever our equation needs okay and if it has this this and this in it then you know, multiply, divide, and multiply, all right, to the appropriate pieces in the appropriate locations. Here's a general rule for the, uh, the transfer function. So if this is, this is what we end up with, okay? So H becomes what we call H prime of S, okay? So if is dimensionless, then H prime of S is equal to H of S. So if we have a circumstance like this one here, then you notice that our H of S remains the same even though we've scaled it properly, okay? We've affected this magnitude, but our uh, transfer function remains the same, which is a very nice property, by the way. Um, if, however, H of S is units of impedance, then we end up with H of S is equal to Km times H, the original H S. And I apologize if you can hear my dog snoring, he's, he's laying on the bed behind me, so, um, yeah, I hope that doesn't show up on the thing. Oh, Dr. Watson, what are you up to? You're sleeping as per usual. Okay, I guess that makes me Sherlock. I don't really know. I think I'm a little too hyper and weird to be Sherlock. Um, but, you know, whatever. Maybe I could be a Moriarty. I think that would work better. Moriarty is more of an Irish name anyway, so that'll work for me. And I'm a mathematician, just like Moriarty. Oh my god, I just realized that I'm Moriarty. Alright, well, mystery solved, Dr. Watson. Uh, I'm, I'm actually Dr. Moriarty. Or will be, I guess. 4 farad capacitor. 
two ohm. <laughs> nice capacitor. <laughs> Super realistic. All right, so we have uh, IC of T going down in here. We're going to take our output voltage as per usual. There we go. Bam. Simple RC circuit uh, with totally impractical uh, element values. So where's our pole here? Uh, let's see. Well, we have some voltage division going on and we have a, a factor up top, la la la. So we should end up with something like HS is equal to one over eight times one over S plus one over eight. So I'm not gonna go through this computation. I'm gonna assume that the book is correct and that you know how to do this at this point. So you can do it, I believe in you. All right, so this transfer function is in fact unitless since it represents the ratio of two voltages. If we choose to generate a more practical circuit, we can scale the impedance elements in the circuit using, let's say a factor of Let's say 10, okay? So for the first resistor, ZR, new, well, this is pretty straightforward. This is just KM times ZR, old, right? So that means that R new is equal to 20 ohms. Huh, pretty easy. Oops, let me add a page here. All right, what about R capacitor? So we had ZC new is equal to KM ZC old. So then this is just going to be equal to 10 times 1 over 4S, which is just equal to 1 over 0.4S, which means that the new capacitor is actually just 0.4 farads. Um, and so our new circuit is just going to look like Vn of T with a resistor and a capacitor still, but we changed up the values. This is 2 fifths farads, and this is 20 ohms. Okay? And you can extend this even further. Uh, to do different things with it. So you could go back through and, and redo the calculation again for the um, for the transfer function and find that the transfer function, in fact, has not really changed at all um, because we have a unitless uh, transfer function in this case. So what if we had chosen our transfer function a little bit differently? So our output variable of interest, what if we wanted it to be IC instead? What if we cared more about that? Well, we would find that our scaling actually did uh, affected the magnitude of the transfer function, in fact, because now instead of having dimensionless units, it's going to ultimately be admittance, and therefore it's going to be scaled by a factor of one over KM. And so let's show that real quick here. So let's suppose, suppose we use instead this other version of the transfer function. Remember that, it, I mean, the book kind of just throws around, you know, H of S willy nilly, but if you wanted to, you can always throw in this subscript in here to help you clarify which one you're talking about. So this one is equal to ICS over VN of S. This is equal to the total admittance of the system. So it's equal to one over the uh, impedance. All right, so we do this calculation real quick. We end up with uh, the following. We know what the impedances are, right? We we'll just throw those together. What the hey? Uh, one over uh, two plus one over four S. So we're good to go there. This is based off the old circuit, by the way. Uh, so this is equal to four S over eight S plus one, which is equal to one half S over S plus one over eight. Okay. Now what happens when we use our new our new version here. So H prime of S then is equal to one over 20 plus one over 0.4 S is equal to 0.4 S over eight S plus one, which is equal to one over 20 factor on the outside S over S plus one over eight. Okay, notice here the difference. Here's the new one. Here's the old one. We have a factor of, of uh, one over 10 factor here. Okay, I'll write that over here. Oops. Okay, so 
it matters which one you pick, what kind of factors you should expect to have back out. More importantly, it matters which one you pick and what thing it's related to and what kind of units it has. At the end of the day, that's really what determines how this factor is calculated. Um, but yeah, but notice here that although the magnitude has changed, that our pole remains the same. All right, so let's move on to frequency scaling. Can we do something about frequency? Yes, we can, okay? We can shift the behavior of the frequency. So let's suppose that I have a behavior that's exhibited at omega equals one, okay? But I want it to exhibit that same behavior at omega equals 10. How would I do this? Well, I could just make KF equal to one over 10 here. And when I put the new frequency in of 10, if I have this KF factor in here, then this is going to effectively be equal to whatever the transfer function was at the old uh, frequency. So it's just a scale factor inside the argument of the transfer function that we're trying to modify. However, comma, what we're really doing with this scaling factor is we're impacting all of our uh, reactive elements. Okay, for non-reactive elements like our steady state impedances, i.e. resistors, they don't impact the frequency. Um, so notice here that when I had uh, this guy, the resistors really aren't directly impacting my frequency. More to the point, in order to exhibit new behaviors at, or excuse me, old behaviors at different frequencies, I, I really just have to focus on the capacitors and inductors in that system. So here's the rule or the thing we care about changing, uh, inductor and capacitor. So let's look at the old inductor values for various J omega values. So remember our S's, we really only care about where they live in terms of frequency on that J omega axis. So we're just gonna put J omega in here and just roll with it. So this was our old definition. Recall that this actually comes from ZL is equal to SL. Similarly, getting ahead of myself, ZC is equal to one over SC. Yeah, you guys remember that? Uh, if not, go back and look it up or take a look, it's in a book. So we have uh, ZL old is equal to J omega L old. So our old value for our uh, uh, inductor. And now we're going to have a new value for our inductor, but we're going to divide everywhere we see that S or that, that omega, effectively, we're going to divide it out by this KF factor. So we do that and we have the old capacitor, or the, the old inductor in there. And now we want to relate that old inductor to the new inductor. Well, the new inductor would be whatever the frequency is, it doesn't really care, times the value of the new inductor. And so in order to get this, we just set these two things equal to each other, bada bing, bada boom. All we end up with at the end of the day is that L new is equal to L old over KF. So we just apply that factor as a uh, division to the old inductor value and we get the new one, okay? Similarly, we'll do the same thing with ZC. So note here that this is equal to ZC old is equal to one over J omega C. And you can see where this is going. ZC new is equal to one, uh, da, 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 KF, there we go, on top. And this is gonna be equal to J omega. Notice here that if you divide by KF, it just pops itself into the numerator, no big deal. And uh, there we are. We just set this equal to uh, the new version, which is one over J omega C new. All of these were old in here, by the way, old capacitor values. And you end up with this, which just changes around, you know, the relationship a little bit. Uh, C new is equal to C old over KF. Okay, so something interesting has happened here, right? What's interesting? Well, remember our rule from before. When we had uh, behavior here, L and C, you divided for magnitude for C and you multiplied for L. In this case, what we have is that you divide for both of these guys. Okay, so now let's suppose that we take our old circuit here 
that we started off with. And instead of just doing a magnitude scaling to it, we actually want to do a frequency scaling. So what would a frequency scaling entail? Well, we know for a fact that our pole resides at S is equal to minus 1 over 8. Yeah, so that's 1 over 8 radians per second, by the way. So it's rather low uh, for a cutoff uh, for the uh, low-pass filter, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, however, if we wanted to, say, move this to 8 radians per second, how would we do it? Well, we just follow the procedure. All we have to do is just take all of our reactive elements, which is in this case just this capacitor, and we're going to scale it by the appropriate factor, which in this case, uh, factor KF is equal to 64. And it's a, it's a not 1 over 64, but a factor of 64 because we're increasing this by uh, that much. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to scale our... Let's just do it this way. We're going to scale this down right, by a factor of 64. So we're going to divide this by 64. So this becomes 1 over 16 farads. And we redo the calculation. So h prime of s is equal to, I don't know why it's getting dotted on me. h prime of s is equal to 1 over 2 plus 16 over s. Okay, and we can rewrite this as follows, s over 2 s plus 16, which is equal to 1 half s over s plus 8. So we see that our pole has shifted to s equals minus 8. This is great. We've increased the frequency of our um, of our Bode plot effectively. Our pole remained, or excuse me, our zero remains exactly where it was before, right at zero. It has not moved at all. So that's that's fantastic. Um, but our distance from the origin uh, there was already zero. So if the if the zero was somewhere else, it may too have been shifted around as well, all right? Um, important thing to note here is that we did not do anything to this resistor to impact our circuit, okay? So when you're doing frequency scaling and just frequency scaling and not worrying about the magnitude, that resistor stays put. So let's look at this here. If we wanna do some kind of frequency and magnitude scaling, this is what we have. All right, everybody, uh, I want to go over some of the homework stuff here now because I haven't done right by y'all, and uh, I want to make sure that you understand what's going on in some of the homeworks. So I know I'm a little delayed on this, but uh, let's dig in, okay? So in I think in, like, uh, homework, was it 26 maybe? Yeah, before this one, you end up running it. Oh, no, maybe not. I was wrong. I thought they're oh yeah here we go so all the way back in problem set 24 you guys even started to see uh some op amps being used in the frequency domain um so i want to go ahead and rectify uh this by looking at a problem set uh from 28 where we definitely start using these okay and i want to set up this problem with you guys so that you understand what's really going on here in the in the laplace domain all right, so bef just before I get into that, um, a quick note about this problem for the last problem set. This is kind of a challenge problem, all right? It's a little bit tricky, and you may have to try to draw the circuit a couple different ways and, and figure out exactly how to get a transfer function that creates this sort of behavior, um, especially with the uh, zeros in there. It can be a little bit of a challenge. So uh, don't be discouraged if it's a little bit hard, but just Keep trying to work through it and try to discover it for yourself on that. Um, these guys should be pretty straightforward. I know the solutions have a lot of garbage in there um, in terms of like all these what look like, you know, bone fish plots um, or fish bone plots. Um, but all you really need to worry about is what makes sense to you in terms of the decibel log scale plotting and trying to keep in mind all the um, decibel, uh, you know, changes those slopes that we have, where it tapers off, where it goes up, what rate it goes up at, etc. So just try to keep some of the stuff in mind and be cognizant of like your starting points, your inflection points, that sort of thing. That's all I'm really looking for for here um, when it says, you know, do the Bode plot. Um, so you do want to do these kind of by hand. I want, you know, some approximations and then um, you should also confirm them using MATLAB, right? This is like 
a fantastic way to check your answer. And if you do slight modifications, it really helps bring things home. Just remember that some of the parameters of the uh, MATLAB script uh, change the way things look completely based on whether or not you have the log on, the scale factor on, the uh, decibel on, etc. How do we set this guy up? Uh, this this is a pain in the butt because like, what do we do with this op amp thing? Actually, it's really not complicated. Uh, what we do is we set it up using our good old inverting amplifier equation. So recall that for the inverting amplifier, uh, you know what? Let me just copy this over real quick with some movie magic. Okay, so here we have uh, this little circuit here. We need to figure out what to do with this guy. So recall that for our regular old inverting amplifier, it looked like this. We had a V in coming in, and then uh, this was going compared to ground, right? Um, and this went into the positive terminal of our op amp, and this went into the inverting or negative terminal of our op amp. Then we had our feedback in here, right? You gotta have that feedback or else this thing is completely useless. We had RF for feedback here, and this was our uh, input resistor. And then, uh, whoopsies, too big. And then we had V out was here. So note here, you know, we're comparing these both to ground, all right? So there's a common ground in this problem. And what we had was a V out was equal to minus RF over R in V in. This is very nice. Um, and actually what we end up doing here is we just say, well, for our gain, we just do something like this. And really what this boils down to is this becomes our transfer function in the Laplace domain now, or the frequency domain. Now, what we're going to do here is add these other impedances to this Rn, because effectively in the in the frequency domain, all these um, elements just become these sort of impedances. Especially if we have you know no initial conditions, we can assume that this is relatively friendly, and we can draw this out rather simply. Okay, so let's do that. And let's redraw this in a, uh, a frequency space type of model. So this becomes uh, 3 here. This is just our uh, S times L, right? So this is 1 over SC. And then here we have just 600. Okay. And then using that equation that we have, this actually becomes rather simple. This is just Vs, and we can treat this like a common ground, just like we would. It really doesn't matter. Um, but effectively, our Rn becomes 3 plus Sl plus 1 over Sc, and Rf, oops, tie that back, Rf becomes uh, just 600. And so when I write out the ratio of these two things, minus Rf over Rn, is just equal to minus 600 over 3 plus S plus uh, 900 over S, right? This guy gets inverted and then inverted again or whatever. So it goes on top <laughs> down there. Okay. And so we're supposed to prove that this is the case. Um, that's pretty easy to do. All we do is multiply top and bottom by S and I end up with the following equation. I get 600 S over uh, S squared plus 3S plus 900. Pretty pretty easy, actually, when you think about it. So this, we just follow the rules for how, however this op amp is configured. And what do you know when I uh, transform this into the Laplace domain, which would make this, by the way, equal to uh, V out of S over V, uh, what is effectively V in of S, but we can call it V S of S. Uh, if you wanted to, you could call this, this is kind of sloppy, but H S of S or however you want to do it or H V. I don't really care. It's our transfer function. It's a transfer function that's useful for us. So we get it there. And then we want to sketch the Bode plot. Well, we've done a lot of stuff with the uh, Bode plot already, but let's do a little bit more just for, for giggles here. Um, so what ends up happening in our Bode plot? Well, Okay, so where are my poles at? Uh, my poles are going to be at negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A, right? So what's this equal to? This is minus 3 plus or minus the square root of B squared, so 9, minus 4 times 
uh, 1 times 900 all over 2 times 1. So this actually is pretty easy to deal with here. Uh, I have minus 3 plus minus uh, 3 comes out here. Uh, and I have 1 minus 400. So this is roughly equal to uh, 2 times... Whoops. This is pretty darn, pretty darn close to negative uh, 400 anyway. So I'm just going to rewrite this as uh, that square root. So this is times j, 2 times 10, right? If you wanted to factor those out. So this is uh, j200, or I'm sorry, j20, bringing the 3 along for the ride. And we end up with just 60 over 2. Um, we can break this up a little bit further, uh, just so we know where, we're, where the heck we are. And we end up with um, minus 3 over 2 plus minus, uh, whoops, j30. Okay, so there we are. A little bit of eraser mechanics there, but you get the idea. Okay, so really approximately we can kind of see that these are going to be much closer to the j omega axis than they are anywhere else. So we can do a little bit of fuddy-duddy math here for our approximation. Let's draw this pole zero plot real quick. We've got a pole right at, uh, excuse me, a zero right at zero. And then our two poles are roughly right here and right here. Um, so at right around j30 and right around minus j30. Okay, so... If you really want to get loose with this, um, you know, you can kind of kind of finagle the numbers to make them work for you. Um, what does this do for us? Well, when we look at the Bode plot, it's actually going to be pretty simple. Uh, we're going to end up with what is effectively at zero. Things are going to, going to change a little bit for us. Um, so right away... But what's the limit of this guy as we get closer and closer to zero, right? That's the real question. Well, that magnitude becomes effectively zero. So if we're not on a log scale here, if this is not log scaled, uh, this is actually going to converge to zero uh, as we're there. So it really depends on where we start counting our axis for the log scale. So I'm not going to worry about that too, too much. But suffice it to say that um, let's say we were at at one here, okay? So effectively at this point, um, the thing should be rising up, right? At a rate of 20 uh, dB per decade. Why is that? Well, because this zero has become insignificant compared to the uh, rise of omega. And when I say it's insignificant, I mean that the component of it, that is, you know, if we had a zero out here at like a thousand, right? It's gonna stay pretty constant as this guy's going up this magnitude, this distance from here all the way out to here. Might as well be a, a, an exoplanet, you know? But because this starts off right at zero, basically the distance, and actually it is, just equal to the distance that omega has traveled. So since this is actually over here, right, on this plot, my net distance is just the net distance that omega has traveled. And it's not this constant that's, you know, too far away to really care about how much it's changed. All right, so this is just rising up at that uh, 20 dB rate until it hits one. And then from there, what we're going to do is, I guess, keep going. <laughs> because we really don't care until about 30, right? So at 30, oops, at about 30, let's, I'm not going to bother with the log scale, I guess, anymore. Let's see, this would be about 30 here, maybe, I don't know. So at about, let me redraw this a little bit. So at about 30, what happens? Well, we run into both of our poles, right? And so then at this point, it should start to go down, down, down at a rate of minus 20, minus 20, because we have two poles to account for, yes? And so this will start to decrease at a rate of... Um, minus 20 dB altogether. 
So the solution manual has a little blip in here. Um, you'll probably see that if you do, um, you know, some of the Bodhi plots there, but it's not, you know, it's not too much to worry about. Um, if you get close enough, that's what I care about. I want you guys to get the general feel of what the plot should look like, not all the nooks and crannies and the exact, you know, decimal values of everything. Just get the general shape of this guy, and I will be very happy, okay? And this is in DB. All right, does that make sense? Hopefully. So, for the maximum, where does it occur? Well, actually, um, the easiest way to do this is just to evaluate it at right around 30, yeah? Because that's where that peak is. And if you really wanted to, you could get finicky with it, but um, by and large, it's going to occur, and it's so difficult because this is, you know, a plus minus here, so where exactly is it going to peak out? Because there's going to be those two values that are sort of competing with one another, which is why you get that sort of funky, blippy behavior. Oops that funky blippy behavior right there in the middle because they're not quite exactly equal to uh, 30J. So you get some of that oddity, right? Because this is a, a fixed constant shifted over. And anyway, um, so they're not quite the same. But anyways, um, what, I, what I wanted to point out is that you can just plug in 30 into the original equation and see what the magnitude is. So when you do that, you end up with minus 600 times uh, 30 over 30 squared plus 3 times 30 plus 900. And you can see exactly what this is going to be if you take the um, magnitude of this. So this, according to solutions, and I, I tend to believe that this is probably true, um, this occurs at roughly 200 for um, HJ Omega. Um, they, they have some weird MATLAB script in here for the normal value or the norm of sys, uh, infinity. I, I don't know what the heck they're trying to do with that, but, um, really you could just peel this off of here from, from your plot if you wanted to, or, or something like that. So that's, that's all fine. Um, however you want to do it, that works, works for me. Okay. So that's pretty much it for that one. Um, Let's see about if there's any other ones we should address. So, so in this one, um, let me go ahead and do uh, some movie magic again. Okay, so for this example, what we're going to do is we're going to use KCL, and then we're going to use a little trick to kind of set this up. All right, so noting for KCL, if we look at this particular node right here, we're going to call it VA, um, what we can do is actually write our current equation while transforming it into the Laplace domain at the same time. So we're just going to look at those impedances and treat them kind of like resistors in the uh, in the frequency domain. That's going to make our lives a lot easier. Now, note that they're going to depend on S for those various um, impedances, but that's exactly what we expect, so we're in good shape. Okay, so for our first current here, we have this guy, and it's just running over that resistor, so this is just going to be Vs minus Va over, oops, over 1. Noting here that this is more of an impedance rather than a, a resistance value, technically. Um, and then we have this is equal to the other two currents. So we have the one flowing from here. Uh, this is just going to be equal to um, the VO over uh, 600 over S. And then we have... I'm sorry, this is uh, not VO. This is the... Uh, VA minus VO, right? It's the difference in those two over uh, 600 over S. Uh, and then plus this guy over here, which is just the uh, voltage VA over uh, 600 divided by S as well. Now, one thing we should note right away here is that this current that's flowing through here has to be equal to the current that's flowing through here because there's no current going between these two terminals, right? So if I if I know that, then I know that VA over 600 over S must then be equal to minus VO over 400. Another way to look at this, if that's confusing to you, um, 
is, you know, you're kind of looking at sort of a, a joint uh, impedance over these two. Okay. Anyways, uh, moving on, we substitute this into the equation. Uh, Vs minus Va is equal to Va minus Vo over 600 S uh, minus Vo over 400. So we get rid of one of those S's conveniently. And we can also use the relationship. Uh, we can also use the relationship here to redefine uh, this business and this business here. I'll fix that a little bit. Okay, so let's do that substitution. And when we do, we end up with Vs plus 1.5 Vo over S is equal to 2 Vo over 400 minus S Vo over 600. Uh, noting here that we're actually just collecting terms here and here uh, to get this. That's hence the two right here, right? Um, from here, what we can do is break this apart and try to write things in terms of Vs and Vo. So then we have Vs is equal to minus Vo, 1.5 over S plus 1 over 200 plus S over uh, 600. And you can see right away here, this is starting to look like a nice little uh, polynomial that we're familiar with. And following through with the math, we end up with uh, VO over, uh, VOS over VS of S must be equal to our transfer function, which as it turns out is minus 600 S over the exact same thing we had before, S squared plus 3S plus 900, which is pretty, pretty darn cool. Now, because our transfer function is exactly identical in every way, we actually uh, should already know how to do pretty much all of this, right? It's the exact same uh, procedure for the Bode plot. Um, we didn't do the, um, the stuff with the phase, but you guys should be able to handle that pretty easily. Um, it's not too bad. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just the exact same thing. So effectively, we've analyzed two circuits in one go, which is great. Okay, I'm going to leave off here today. I, uh, I hope this lecture is shorter when I finish doing my edits, uh, because last time was woof, just a lot. Okay, and uh, I thank you guys for your attention, and we'll see you next time.